the Lord has been speaking to me increasingly over the past 18 months in dreams and visions. Initially, they were mostly about myself and my own personal circumstances, but latterly, recently, it's been increasingly about the Lord, about his bride and about his return. And I asked the Lord what I should do about this, and he spoke two scriptures to me. Um, the first one was, forgive the low tech, was Mark 4.21, which is, um, he, and he also said unto them, is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not to be set on a lampstand? And Acts 4.20, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So I felt very strongly that I needed to do something to share the things that the Lord's been laying on my heart, which is why I'm making this video today. The first thing I want to share is a dream that I had a couple of weeks ago, and it concerned a wedding. Um, it was my wedding. I have to say I've been married for nearly 25 years, so I know that it's not an up-and-coming event for me in that sense, personally. But uh, it was about, I was going to be married, but I had this sense that I wasn't ready for the wedding and I felt very anxious and concerned about it. And when I woke up, I asked the Lord, I said, um, am I in some way not ready for your return? And he didn't say anything directly to me, so I just kind of filed that away for, for later revelation. And then I had another dream about a week ago that was really, really clear. I was getting married, I was in a church, and I was in the vestry, and uh, all the guests were assembled in the main body of the church, and they were waiting, and I had a sense I'd been keeping them waiting for quite some time. In fact, I knew that I had been keeping them waiting for half an hour and a half, which is 90 minutes. Now, biblically, the number 90 has a significance and it represents the, from what I can find out from my research, it represents the sifting or the suffering of the saints and also what the saints do while they're waiting for Jesus' return. So that seemed very relevant and opposite. So they were all sitting waiting and I was in the vestry and I had my wedding dress and there was nothing wrong with my wedding dress, that was fine. But I suddenly became aware that I was lacking certain things. First one is a little bit embarrassing. Um, it, uh, it, I realised I didn't have any underwear on. And uh, the second thing I realised was I didn't have any shoes. And the third thing I realised was I didn't have any jewellery and I really needed my wedding pearls. And uh, so I had to ask my husband to please go home quickly, my husband that I've been married to for 25 years nearly, and, and get these things for me and bring them for me. Then the third dream that I had, which was a couple of days afterwards, I dreamt I was not in a church at all, but there was a wedding going on. It was one of these um, wedding venues that people prefer to go to if they don't want to get married in church. So it was something like a castle or a stately home. It was a beautiful venue, but it wasn't a church. And I was in this room where a couple were supposed to be getting married. <coughs> Excuse me. And I noticed it was painted very, very white. And the thought came to me about whited sepulchres. And they were sitting with their back to a very big window. And there was a veil over the window. There was no wedding ceremony. There were no guests. And all there was was a photographer in front of them taking lots and lots of pictures. And I was in the room and I had the sense that I was in the wrong place. I, this was nothing to do with me. I really ought not to be there. And so I was trying to sneak out of the room without making a noise and disturb what was going on. But I wasn't successful and they noticed me. And they took all these photographs and uh, they were not really particularly nice photographs. They were just the sort of thing that you could, you know, snap, holiday snaps that you get uh, developed at the chemists. And they handed me uh, a big stack of them to look at. Um, before I left and I'm, I was aware that there were 180 of these photographs. 
Well, the interpretation I have for these dreams, the first one is um, the dream where I just had the sense that I wasn't ready, reminded me very much of the, uh, the scripture about the foolish virgins. And um, I can bring that to you here. That's Matthew 25. Matthew 25, 6 to 13. Try and hold it up so you can see. And at midnight a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterwards the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So the foolish virgins had not got oil in their lamps and the oil of course represents the Holy Spirit and they turned to others uh, and asked if they could have some of theirs and in the end they were not allowed to go to the wedding and I feel that the Lord is saying that he's coming back and his church isn't ready and one of the things is that they're neglecting the Holy Spirit over the last week or two the Lord's spoken to me a lot about the Holy Spirit and it's reminiscent also of uh, Revelation which says may the church listen to the things that the Spirit is saying to the church. And the church really does need to start listening to the Holy Spirit and being led by the Holy Spirit. Um, the interpretation of the second dream, uh, <clears throat> well, I had my wedding dress. Now, the Lord uh, provides us with our, with our white um, robes, the robes of righteousness. It is only through his sacrifice, through what Jesus did for us on the cross, um, that we may receive his righteousness when we repent of our sin and we give our lives to him. Um, so there was nothing wrong with what he'd provided me with. He'd already done everything, but it was me. I was not making myself ready and I did not have, well, first of all, I did not have my underwear. And it reminded me of the scripture in uh, Revelation 3, 7, which I'll share with you here which says because you say I am rich I have become wealthy and I have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched miserable poor blind and naked so there are those in the church that think they're okay but actually they are deceiving themselves or we are deceiving ourselves we all need to sort of take all these things to ourselves and, and seek the Lord as to where we stand um, also, I didn't have any shoes, so I was not shod with the gospel of the preparation of peace. I believe that the that the church is perhaps neglecting her duties in regard to the to the gospel. Um, and without shoes, you know, you're going nowhere. You can't go anywhere. And the third thing was my wedding pearls. It was very clear that my jewellery that I was lacking was pearls, and pearls uh, represent the word of God, His words of wisdom. So the church is neglecting the Holy Spirit, the church is neglecting the gospel, and the church is neglecting the word of God, and as a result, she is naked, and she doesn't even realise it. And she's delaying the Lord's return, because the wedding guests were all assembled, and they had been waiting for 90 minutes. So the question is, what is the church doing in this period of time of waiting for Jesus to come back? We all need to look at this really, really carefully. I promise you, I took this to myself first when I got before the Lord and I asked him to show me where I am falling short. But also, I felt very much that this was something I had to share with others. The third dream was where it was not even in a church, it was in a, a wedding venue. <clears throat> and uh, this, I believe, is for the apostate church, where we've gone even beyond where the other churches that I've spoken to you about were lacking 
<clears throat> they're in a, a a beautiful venue. I mean, I was struck by how beautiful it was. I was there. I thought, oh, this is lovely. This is gorgeous. And there are churches out there that are trying to be, I believe it's called seeker friendly, and they are trying <clears throat> to make the gospel feel look appealing uh, to the world. And in so doing, they're compromising. And uh, the whiteness of the walls, the Lord spoke to me and said, they are as unto whited sepulchres. Um, but inside there are dead men's bones. And the wedding couple were not even wearing the, uh, the, the, the white clothing that they needed, the righteousness of Christ. They were in dark, ordinary, casual clothes like black jeans. They, that reminded me of the scripture um, where in Matthew, where it says, Matthew 22, 11 to 13. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have a wedding garment. So he said to them, friend, how do you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's a very, very serious word for the church to hear, you know, and the church needs the body of Christ. We, those who call ourselves Christians, need to check out where actually are we. The church I saw in this third dream was a church that didn't even want to get married in church. I didn't even want to be in the church and want to be part of the church. There was no wedding vestments. There was no ceremony. It was all about the trappings. They were sitting with their back to the window. They had turned their back on the light. Jesus is the light of the world. They turned their back on him. There was a veil over the light. So the light that they were presenting uh, was veiled. It was dimmed down. It was it was watered down. And that speaks uh, of the apostate church, the, the compromising church. Um, also the photographs. I felt that all they wanted really were the trappings of the wedding. Um, so they're having the photographs done. It was all about the show, you know. And the stack of photographs that I was given, that there were 180 of them, the uh, the meaning of 180 in the Bible and biblically is repent. It's like turning 180 degrees. There needs to be a 180 degree turn repentance. And the only word that the Lord has to say to the church that is in that state is repent. So those are my f three dreams. And the important thing is that the church needs to make herself ready. Um, in Revelation 19, the word says, Revelation 19 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. The Lord gives us our garments of righteousness, but the rest of it we have to do. It's about the bride making herself ready. And to do that, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to be listening to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. We need to make sure that we are not lukewarm. We need to be repentant. We need to be walking closely, living by the power of the Holy Spirit, listening to him, him each day. We need to be in the word, searching the word of God in a Berean fashion. Those are the pearls of wisdom. And we need not to neglect the gospel. It's not about us only, um, our relationship with Christ. It's also about going out for the lost, because that's what Jesus paid the high price for. So we must do business directly with the Lord. It's, it's, I feel it's very, very urgent. And um, I spent a day, as I say, I've had other dreams as well, which I'm going to share in a minute. But um, I spent a day in, in prayer and fasting this week to really seek the Lord. You know, is there anything I need to do personally? And I would urge you to do the same, please. Um, and also to what I should do about uh, these words that he's giving me for the church. <clears throat> there were also some very other significant dreams that I've had which are connected to these um, these dreams that I'm sharing. And the first one that I had was very strange. The Lord showed me in a dream, showed me this. 26 dot dot 26, like a digital clock. <clears throat> and I had the sense in my spirit in my dream that it had to do with time. It wasn't just a scripture. It had to do with time. And then I dreamt some other things. And then just before I woke up, the Lord showed it to me again. And I heard him say, now remember this. And I spent some time uh, seeking the Lord about this, what it actually meant. And I found some um, interesting 
things uh, when, in my research about what the, uh, what the number 26 actually means. Um, I understand that 26 in Hebrew is written uh, like this. I have to put this up for you. So it, it's, I'm not, I don't speak Hebrew, but it's written with two Hebrew letters, kaf and vav, and it means the power of salvation. And to write 26 in Hebrew, they wrote two Hebrew letters, kaf and vav, and these signify an open hand with a nail. The power of salvation is pictured by Jesus' hand being nailed to the cross. 26 is the number signifying the power of salvation. The Hebrew word salvation is Yeshua, which is Jesus' Hebrew name. Thus the power of salvation is also the power of Jesus. Likewise, the Hebrew name for Yahweh sig carries a numeric value of 26. Um, so I felt that, well, I did seek the Lord for revelation about this. 26 dot dot 26, it looks like a digital clock and the word Yahweh is 26 so we have Yahweh dot dot Yahweh and it's to do with the power of salvation it's to do with Yeshua as well and <clears throat> when I was praying and fasting about it the Lord just suddenly gave me the revelation really cl clearly he said it's it's God's clock so this is about timing and about time and, and hence why the urgency is there it's God's clock and then Two days later, the Lord woke me up uh, in the morning, very early, it, well, very early for me, and I looked over the bed at my husband's clock and I saw he has a digital clock with, you know, numbers that you could see in the dark, and it said 521. And so I lay back down again, I said, Lord, if you want me to pray about something or say something to me, please do so. Um, Otherwise, can I go back to sleep? I've got to go to work. And then I looked at the clock again and it said 5.26. And then sometimes when I'm trying to get to sleep, I count. Like people count sheep. I just count without sheep to see if it helps me. And I was suddenly became aware that I was counting in my head. And I was counting 25, 24, 23, 22, 21. 25, 24, 23, 22, 21. And <clears throat> as I did so, the Lord spoke to me and he said, the countdown, the countdown has begun. And the number five in the Bible uh, signifies grace. And it was as if the five stood for the period of grace that we have been in since Jesus first came uh, 2000 years ago, um, up till when he comes back. So we had 525, then we had 524, then we had 523 and so forth. So it's covered by grace, but it's counting down. The period of grace is counting down. And I did research the other numbers, 25, 24, and so forth. I won't go into it in too much depth because there are different opinions about what these numbers actually mean. However, what I did find that where there seemed to be a pretty consistent interpretation of it was when you get to 20, 20 means the end of a time of patient waiting. So I felt that the Lord was saying that he was counting down and we are getting close to the end of the time of patient waiting. And also, as I was praying and fasting and asking the Lord for revelation of the things he was sharing with me, I suddenly realized that the clock was on my husband's bedside. It's actually my husband's clock. Now, I have a husband, he is my husband, but also scripturally, Jesus is my husband. It was my husband's clock. And my husband's clock was counting down. And not only was it any clock, it was an alarm clock and the purpose of an alarm clock is to say wake up so again there is this urgency there it's God's clock 26 26 it's God's timing it's my husband's clock it's Yeshua's clock and he's counting down now for the end of the period of grace the end of the period of five when we get to 20 which I didn't see but when we get there because that comes after 21 then it's the end of the time of patient waiting and it's his clock and it's an alarm clock and again he's saying church wake up the time is coming to an end I am coming back what are you doing in these 90 minutes that you have while you're waiting you're delaying my, my return what are you doing um, in this time 
are you preparing yourself or are you not? Are you going to be like the foolish virgins? Well, um, I spent a day, two days ago, fasting and praying and seeking the Lord about this. And the day that, when the morning when I woke up that day, I had had another dream. So you see, I just think it is so urgent that the Lord is giving me all of these revelations and I'm not accustomed to this quantity of revelations. So please do also take this seriously. I had had a dream of two people that I know, two friends of mine, and they were both pregnant and it was a surprise, but they were delighted and um, their husbands were very pleased too. Um, but both of these women, it struck me afterwards, uh, were past the age of childbearing. They're both in their 50s. And <clears throat> when I woke up, I thought, one of these women, I haven't seen her for a long time. And it went through my head, maybe I should make a journey to see her. And as soon as I thought that, it came back to me that Mary made a journey when she was pregnant to see Elizabeth, who was pregnant. And it struck me about Elizabeth and also about Sarah. Now, when Mary went to see Elizabeth, she spent 90 days with her. Again, there is the 90, the time of waiting for the fulfillment, for the return of Jesus. Sarah was 90 years old. Both of those women were past the age of childbearing. Elizabeth bore Isaac, and that set in motion the promise that was given to Abraham of the, that through his family, the Messiah would come. When it got to Elizabeth, that brought about, as it were, the end of that time of waiting for the Messiah to come. Uh, because John the Baptist was born and he, of course, heralded the return of uh, the, sorry, the birth of Jesus. And by the time John the Baptist arrived, actually, Jesus was already on the way. So I felt again that this was a very significant thing, that matters had been set in motion. Uh, a long time ago and now they are coming to their fruition and it is interesting that both women were past their bearing childbearing years and as were my two friends in my dream and all of these children were born by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Isaac would not have been born unless God had done it miraculously because Elizabeth was uh, sorry because Sarah was too old. Equally, John would not have been born if the Lord had not done it supernaturally because Elizabeth was too old. And of course, Jesus um, was God's son. So that was also by the power of the Holy Spirit. So again, there was a reminder of the Holy Spirit. Um, earlier in the day, also, the Lord had spoken to me about the Holy Spirit. Um, he showed me a vision of a fountain. It wasn't a big, attractive spraying fountain. It was like a spring bubbling up. But I had the word fountain and then he spoke the scripture to me of uh, Revelation 21.6 and I, I looked it up and it says, uh, and he said, and he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. So again, the Lord is saying, listen to the Holy Spirit, be filled with the Holy Spirit. God wants to give it to us freely. But as for these, for these women, and I asked the Lord what I should do about the dream and what the interpretation of it was, was I felt that uh, it's to do with um, intercession and intercessors, that we need to pray for the, um, for the church uh, that she should finally make herself ready because the Lord is coming. Remember when John the Baptist came, Jesus was already on the way. The countdown has started. So we need to do as John the Baptist did and we need to herald his return. The last thing that the Lord showed me on that day, uh, my day of prayer and fasting, I said, Lord, is there anything else you want to show me before I do the mundane things and go downstairs and cook dinner? And I saw clocks, I saw lots of clocks, um, like um, the mechanics of a, of a Swiss watch or something. I could see all of the wheels and the cogs turning and I could hear ticking. I could hear the sound tick, tick, tick. And it got louder and louder and louder till it was actually deafening. So again, the Lord is really emphasizing that time is running out 
um, and he is coming. He is coming. And even I went downstairs and um, after my meal I sat down and I put on a programme uh, that I had recorded and all I knew was it was a Jewish voice programme because I'm interested in the, the Jewish roots of our Christian faith. And I had no idea what the topic was or anything and I put it on and I could not believe my eyes uh, or my ears even I should say when he started talking about 1948 and how Israel became a country again and he said on God's clock that was the beginning of the countdown and he said tick 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 and he said it again tick 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 I know the Lord has confirmed this also through a friend of mine um, she was working on on some playing some music and I have got this here somewhere and uh, I, I sent her a message on Facebook about the things the Lord was saying and she said to me basically she said she was playing her piano and she said I just I just can't believe it she said I, I wanted to get up and um, pause my timer because I wanted to go and do something and she said, I could not believe my eyes when I realized I had stopped the timer on 26 26 so I cannot emphasize enough how urgent this is. And please, church, wake up. Do business with the Lord. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't neglect him. Listen to the Holy Spirit. In, as individuals, we need to please do business with the Lord and ask him, in what way am I not ready for your return? I don't want to be left behind. Make sure we are in the word of God and we are being Berean, the pearls. Make sure that we're not neglecting the gospel. And please do not be part of the apostate church. Do not settle for the trappings of what sort of masquerades as church or the body of Christ, but actually isn't. Don't be one of the ones where when Jesus comes back, he says, why are you not appropriately dressed for my wedding? And be thrown out or have the door shut upon you. So thank you so much for listening. If the Lord gives me anything else, I'll be pleased to share that too. It's uh, Good Friday today, so we praise the Lord for what he did for us on the cross all that time ago, without which none of this would be possible. The number 26, I understand, in Hebrew is written as the first symbol uh, is the hand and the second is a nail through the hand, the power of salvation. So it is, we are only given one name under heaven by which men may be saved, and it's the, the Lord Jesus. He died for us to take God's wrath and punishment for our sins. And if we confess our sins and if we repent, then he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So please seek the Lord, receive his salvation, which is a free gift, through faith, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. And seek the Lord as to how you can be close to him and hear his voice as he speaks to you by his Holy Spirit in these last days. God bless you. Thank you.